morning, all. Happy Sabbath to y'all. It's now time for our call to worship and invocation. If you'd like to turn to the back of your hymnals to number 885, it's only one verse, so there's no responsive reading this morning. I'm just going to wait a few seconds for you to turn to that. Number 885. It's a beautiful verse, too. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Stop being anxious and watchful, for I am your God. I give you strength. I bring your help. I uphold you with my victorious hand. May God bless his word on this today. Let us all bow our heads for prayer this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. We want to thank you for giving us the ability to be here this morning. I especially pray for those that are struggling this morning, who are petitioning your name. I please ask you to be with them in a special way. You're a God of mercy. You're a God who wants to deliver people from sin. You are a God that wants to deliver people from sickness. And I pray that you be with those people, especially today. Thank you, for, for Lord, for, for who you are, for the being that you are, and for all that you do for us. Please be with the pastor today as he presents the word for us later. I thank you for all that you do. I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. So, show of hands, who has ever fixed something? Really, not one of you. There we go. Someone has fixed something. Who has watched their parents fix something? GDK. All right. So, when you're fixing something, what do you use? Good. You use tools. Tools let you do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Now, every time I leave my house, I carry two tools with me, and I'm going to show you what those tools are. What's this? Good, a flashlight. 
And that lets me, if I'm in somewhere really, really dark, I can shine this in and I can see where I'm going so I don't bump into things. I keep that in my pocket on the left every time I leave my house. What's this? Good, a knife. Now that's a useful thing. It's kind of a dangerous thing. You have to use it correctly. You have to know how to use it or you can hurt yourself or others. But I find I end up using this every day to open stuff, pick things out of places. You'd be amazed what you can fix with a good knife. Now, I'm willing to bet every single one of you uses a tool every day, but you don't think necessarily that it is a tool. So let's say you wanted to make someone understand what you're thinking. What would you do? Or let's say you're having a tantrum. Has your parent ever said, use your words? So you might not think about it, but words themselves are a tool, and they let you share ideas, they let you share feelings. They're really powerful, and they're so powerful they can even change countries and change the world. So if our words are that powerful, think about how much more powerful the words of God are. So I'm going to read you two verses, and they talk about how God's word is a tool. So Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So sharper than my knife, the word of God. And then Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. We're supposed to use these tools. Matthew 4.4 4 tells us, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So, just like it's important for me to learn how to use my knife so I can use it well when I need it, or keep my flashlight on me so I can see in the dark, it's important for all of us to read the Bible, because the Bible is the Word of God. And so that's why we come to church, we study in Sabbath school, and we study at home with our families and alone. So remember, as you grow up, you're going to face a lot of problems. You're going to solve a lot of problems. Remember that God gave you the perfect tool to know how to face those. Who wants to pray? All right. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day, Sabbath day you gave us. Help me, to help me throughout this day to be able to praise you and bless all the ones who are here at the at this church, Lord, you are, t you try to teach me everything you know, Lord. Try to help me be good, a good child and use my words correctly to your will. And help me listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, thank you. You may go back to your seats. Our office administrator is on vacation. That's why we have no bulletins. Some of you are savvy enough to know how to pull it up on your phone. I wasn't. I took mine off the computer before I came today. But uh, for, for those who are curious, uh, the uh, pianist this morning is uh, Annette Siver. Uh, Ralph Dawkins is our song leader. Richard Clark gave the uh, uh, children's story. Uh, I am Margarita Merriman. I'll be doing the prayer and the announcements. Uh, Ruby Hernandez will be doing the scripture. Mayor Monroe will be singing for us. And the pastor, of course, will be preaching. I have three announcements that I would like to add to what's in the bulletin. Uh, actually, one of them is in the bulletin, but in case you missed it, uh, the picnic today is at the home of of uh, 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 Josephine Robertson, and the address is 26 Long Hill Road in Lemonster. Uh, we're asked to bring our chairs and our food, and if you're a, vi a visitor, why, you don't need to bring food. Hope to see you there. Uh, Ilana gave us this announcement. Uh, join us for our next overflow worship on Friday, 
July 21 at 7 p.m. We will worship together in song led by the Hunt family and the word brought to us by Bob Falkenberg, our conference president. We hope to see you there. That's at 7 p.m. Friday, uh, the 21st. And we have uh, an announcement uh, from Nicole Burchette. Vacation Bible School registration has closed. However, we will still take signups through the end of today only. Grab a flyer or visit the Children's Ministry page on our website for more details. We are also asking for our church family to be praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit during this week. We have a wonderful group of children and many new families. Please pray for a safe, engaging, and heart-deep experience for the children, their families, and all of our Vacation Bible School volunteers. It is time for our congregational prayer. I would ask you to stand while uh, we sing the, the prayer song, which will be led by Ralph. There's a possibility that everyone has not received um, the prayer song handout. You can find the prayer song number 265 in your church hymnal, and we will only sing the first verse. Number 265, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. you to bow in prayer if you're able kneel in prayer dear heavenly father we come into your presence glad to be back in our church home after two sabbaths worshiping with our extended southern new england conference church family we accepted the challenge to work together in the mission of spreading the gospel as the Spirit leads us in our daily walk. As inspiring as those two weeks were, it is good to experience a more intimate worship environment. We will recognize our inadequacies as we pursue the goals set before us, loving you with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us, lead us be by your spirit and bring to completion the good work you began in us at the start of our Christian journey. Prosper the work of our hands, bless our feeble attempts at ministry and guide us in ways to spread the gospel to our neighbors. And bless those of our members who have special needs, whether physical, spiritual, or financial. May they not hesitate to make us aware of their needs. We pray for the younger members of our congregation. Some are home from college. Some have just graduated from SLA or some other high school. Some are seeking direction for meaningful ways to spend the summer. Some are in the valley of decision about career choices or marriage options. Guide them each one. We also remember Vacation Bible School that starts July 10, an effective outreach of our church. This week we celebrate the birth of our nation. I cannot recall a time when the country experienced such moral turmoil and animosity as in the present. Lord, you've blessed our nation in the past. Please don't abandon us to the egos of those who put self above country. 
If there are statesmen among us, may they come forward and be recognized. We are fortunate to still be able to worship or not worship according to the dictates of our conscience. In many countries, that is not the case. Protect your saints who are struggling in countries where Christianity is not welcome. May our media outreach ministries such as 3ABN, Hope Channel, and Adventist World Radio penetrate the darkness so that the gospel can go to all the world and Jesus will come to call us home. We long for the establishment of your eternal kingdom. Help us each to be ready. We pray this, all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. and I'm reading the scripture this morning from Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. If you will turn with me, 25 to 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? May the Lord bless the reading to your souls. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Happy Sabbath to all of you and your families. I'm going to sing a very nice song for you. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadows of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fell not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy I see. All I have needed, thy hand have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in the quarters above, joined with a nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy I see. All I have needed, thy hand had provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and peace that endureth. Thy own dear present to cheer and to guide. Straight for today and bright hopes for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand 
hills beside him. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, you mercy I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Thank you, Jesus. I was in three years on Thursday. God bless you all. She said 83, but I don't believe her. <laughs> Mary, thank you. And thank you for your legacy and your testimony, just how you live. We really are blessed. We really are blessed. I invite you to pray with me as we begin a looking at a subject that I think is germane to all of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, as Mary just sang for us, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, if we're honest, the unfaithfulness part is on our part. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for being there. But how often we forget that we are serving a God who has existed for the ages, who spoke this world into existence, who is the source of all wisdom and all knowledge. How often we forget that. But Lord, thank you that we can keep coming back to you. And I pray, Lord, that as we face life, we will face it. Looking at life, looking at reality, not from our perspectives, but from yours. Be with us these few moments. In the saving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen was 82 years ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stood before Congress and talked about the four freedoms that all people should have. The freedom, the first of all, was freedom of speech and of expression, that he envisioned this, this would go out throughout the whole world. The second one was the freedom to worship God in his own way. The third freedom was freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings, which will secure to every nation a healthy, peacetime life for its inhabitants. And the fourth freedom was a freedom from fear, which translates into a world terms meaning a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion, he said, that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor. He saw this vision as attainable within, quote, our own time and generation, end quote. 82 years ago, how are we doing? How are we doing? Worldwide, Freedom of religion, speech from want, from fear. I don't think we're doing too good. I don't think we're doing too good. Worldwide, I don't think we're doing too good. But it made me think, what are the freedoms of the kingdom of heaven? What are the freedoms that God gives to me and to you and to us? I would say it's sort of similar. Freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to really worship, freedom. And one of those freedoms, my friend, is that thing that I know we all engage in. It's called worry. Worry. So turn with me in your Bibles to that chapter we know as the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. And as you're turning there, I want to just give some context. The year is 29 A.D., the area is Galilee. 
The newest thing that Jesus has done is he has accumulated 12 apostles with him. These are brand new. These are rookies. These guys are green. And he preaches this sermon, the greatest sermon and the most comprehensive sermon ever preached in history. You could call a declaration, a constitution, a bill of rights, whatever. There are people listening to this. And it's a sermon that touches every aspect of our lives, including that issue of worry. And so with that, let's pick it up in verse 25 where Jesus says these words, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Let's pause there for a moment and say, as Margarita mentioned, you may have noticed that people are a little bit more on edge these days. Have you caught it? My wife and I were in a parking lot, and, and there was just this re- moment when somebody, I think, was trying to pull out, and, 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 and there was a car there, and it was like this knee-jerk reaction, like on the horn, and of course, the number of sign, I believe, number one sign was given to the other person, and you know what I mean by that, but the number one sign, and it was like, what's going on here? Well, the word worry tells us so much. It actually means, of course, to feel uneasy or troubled or anxious or distressed. But the key is, is that the old English, the word is worgen, worgen, which means to strangle, to strangle, to kill, which actually comes from the word meaning rope. In case you haven't noticed, a lot of us are being strangled right now. Oh, we don't see the rope. But you can see it on our expressions, the facial expressions, the body language. You can see in the tone of our voices that something is going on underneath the surface. And Jesus has the audacity to tell the listener there as they are living under the tyranny of Rome to say, do not worry about your life. What in the world is he talking about? Has he lost his mind? You got to get rid of Rome. You got to deal with that. Get rid of them. But Jesus has the audacity to say, do not worry. Now, worry, let's have a working definition here. You may say, what's the opposite of worry? Well, I'm going to propose it is not peace. It's not tranquility. It's not peace or tranquility. It is, dare I say, to look at reality from the perspective of God. To look at reality from the perspective of God. And let me be honest with you, this is indeed a challenge of a lifetime. And and I want to remind us, and yes, pastors do worry. We do share our, our times of worry. We're in good company. The Bible is filled with worriers. Remember Elijah? Jezebel? Remember Moses? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these guys, they all worried. Martha, the story all goes on and on. This is not a matter of salvation, my friends. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of who do we really understand who we are. And my point, my, the, the, the key text, is right there in the Sermon on the Mount. In the center, almost in the center of the Sermon on the Mount, is that prayer we call the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with two very important words, Our Father. That's not just poetry, my friends. This is reality. Jesus is saying, remember, God is your father. You are his children. Remember that. And worry happens when we forget who our father is. And when we do that, we forget who we really are. And that's where the devil comes in. Now you may say, oh, pastor, you're wanting me to be a superhuman. You're calling us to be supermen, superwomen. No, I'm not. This is not about being superhuman. This is about being suprahuman. Supra means to go above. To get above the smog and the pollution of the world. Do you know what I'm saying? 
to somehow transcend it because we remember something. Oh yeah, this isn't just my place. This isn't it. There's something more going on and we have a vantage point that other people simply do not have. So Jesus, this is God speaking. This is God in the flesh. He says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, about what you buy, what you're going to wear. And then he goes on to say, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Then he goes into the amazing object lesson. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Now, have you ever been mesmerized by staring at a bird? Everybody just, you had, you had that moment, and you're looking at it, just marvel. And then in that one moment, in, in, a, in a microsecond, it does a little leap, and, and it just flaps its wings, and off it goes. And you think, wow, wouldn't that be kind of cool to be able to do that? to fly away. It's so popular of an idea that Lenny Kravitz wrote a song, Fly Away. I wish I could fly into the sky so very high, just like a dragonfly. To be able to go away. And I'm sure every single one of us, whether we're in a good situation, bad system, have been said, wow, wouldn't that be cool to just look at the world from a different perspective? To sort of go from here to the beach, to the pond, the lake, just be able to do that. And so Jesus says, consider the birds. Birding is a big field, isn't it? Bird watching is big. There's tours, there's apps, there's expensive binoculars you could buy. I read, I looked this up. There's one by one company. The cheapest one they sell is $2,700. That's expensive birds. $2,700. Well, Birds change our lives. And the incident I want to share with you about is happened in early morning, May 25, the year 2020. Christian Cooper did what he did for 30 years. He went to Central Park to the section called the Rambles to go bird watching. So far everything was fine, he was there, but there were a couple of dog owners who had left their, let their dogs off the leash, which was a no-no, and so he politely asked one of the dog owners to restrain the dog. Well, Christian Cooper began encouraging her to, to do that, the dog owner, whose name, interesting enough, was Amy Cooper, no relation. And the thing, the situation escalated very, very quickly to the point that he saw something wasn't going to go right here. He pulled out his phone, began recording the incident, and she pulls out her phone, and as she's pulling out her phone, she says 14 words that changes his life. I'm going to call the police and, quote, I'm going to tell them that there's an African-American man threatening my life. Remember this story? He catches this on his phone. And, of course, what happens is her life falls apart. She ends up with legal problems. She ends up losing her job. Her, her life has changed forever. But Christian Cooper, however, his life took a totally different trajectory because of birds. Now he has a book out. In 2021, National Geographic contacted him if, to see if he would host a television show on birding. And now, he says, he is living a dream he never thought would be possible. He goes on a plane to exotic places looking for birds. And he said he could never have imagined that that incident in Central Park, because of birds, would have transformed his life in such a positive way. He could never have imagined it. Birds. No wonder Jesus said, consider the birds. Consider them, because they may just change your life. Now, Jesus doesn't say consider the sheep. He doesn't say consider the fish. He doesn't consider the earthworm. He says consider the birds, because they fly. But it's as if Jesus is saying, let's have our minds in the, let's have our minds in the sky. He's also saying, make sure you have your feet on the ground. 
Because look at the next, uh, next object lesson in verse 28. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, all the splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father, your heavenly Dad, knows that you need them. I hope that everyone here in this room has asked in faith that Jesus would put his robe of righteousness on them. Have said, Jesus, I need your robe of righteousness. Cover my sinfulness. I need your help. And I'm saying that because one day you and I will have the privilege of meeting our Lord and Savior and he will give us another kind of a robe and he will give us a crown. And the key is, is what do we do from that moment except, of accepting Christ to the moment when he actually gives us that robe and that crown? And sometimes our brains do strange things. We think we're on our own. And we forget that our Father knows what we need. We forget our identities. We forget who we really are. We forget our, what our true DNA is. We forget what really keeps our heart going. I have got to tell you about a lunatic named Rodney Orr. This guy is not human, all right? This guy is, dare I use the word, suprahuman. So. Rodney loved to go uh, ocean sea deep diving for mollusks. And he would go, I believe, coast of California, I'm not sure, Australia. But he would go and dive for these. The problem was the area he would like to dive was shark infested. Now, the chance, he says, of getting bitten by a shark is about 1 in 14 million. Rodney has had it happen twice. So the first time, like decades earlier, he was out looking for mollusks and, or he, and, and he, was, he just felt this chomp on his, what do you call this area, the stomach area. And he felt it and he knew what had happened. Fortunately, he had one of his weight belts there and the shark released him and he goes to the surface and swims ashore with minor injuries. Now that's the funny thing, my friend, the first time. Now, I don't know about you, but usually when there's a shark in the water or a possible shark in the water, we tend to stay out of the water. Now, Rodney, no. That was the first time. The second time was a little stranger and more serious. It happened September 9, 1990. He was at the surface of the water, and then suddenly everything went dark. He heard a crunch, and he thought that a boat had hit him. He's totally disoriented, he's feeling around, and he feels the head of a great white shark. His head is in the shark. He instinctively is trying to poke at the eye of the shark to be released, and after a few, maybe feet or so, he gets spit out. He says his cheekbone is exposed, half of his nose is hanging off, Hope nobody's eating it right about now. And one side of his body is essentially paralyzed because he cannot swim. But somehow or another, he gets to shore. He says he was literally a walking bloody mess. People on the beach are screaming. He ends up to the hospital where he gets 60, it was 60 stitches in his neck and head. The next Monday, he reports to work as an electrician, which was his job, and then a week later, he was back to diving. I'm saying that because that is not a normal human being. That is not a normal human being. Now, I'm saying that because that is exactly the point. 
Jesus is challenging me, is challenging you to not live like a normal human being. To live like not a normal human being. You see, normal people do store up for themselves treasures on earth. But Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Normal people, normal people, when they get hurt, they hurt back. Jesus says, love your who? Enemy. He even says, turn the other cheek. I just came across a statistic that was really, really alarming. 49%, 49% of evangelicals did not realize that turn the other cheek concept was in the Bible. Think about that for a second. Didn't realize that was in the Bible. Now, now, now normal people, normal people treat other people as disposable or as objects. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, you won't do that. Jesus challenged us that when somebody hates us, we actually, we don't we do like normal people. We don't hate back. You know, my friends, this is not something that comes naturally to us. And Jesus even says, do not worry. Do not worry, because it's a very natural thing for us to do. It's very natural for me to see that the world revolves around me and how am I going to navigate the situation without really, really looking at the deeper issues. I got to tell you about chaplain, hospital chaplain Steve Cuss. 24 years old, he had just gotten married, first day on the job. He's in the trauma uh, hospital, trauma unit, two hours into the job. He was called into a room where there's a dozen people, everybody's screaming. He said there was one person banging their head against the wall. One person was, was throwing up in a waste pass in, in a garbage can. He got there totally disoriented. It was like he was like watching a movie. And he's only reassured himself by saying, well, at least the doctors and nurses are here. They will know what to do. But about a minute later, they left. What do you do? What do you do when you're facing anxiety? What do you do? And he said the key is with anxiety is to realize what it is. It's the gap between what is happening in the moment and what we think we need to be okay. There's that gap. What's happening, what we need to be okay. And there's that gap. And he said, don't focus so much on, by the way, he's faced in that first year, he dealt with 300, over 300 deaths as a, as, a, as a chaplain. He said, don't focus on the weir, the, the worry or the fear. Be more focused on, the per, on identifying the perceived needs in our lives. Be focused on the perceived needs in our lives. Jesus is telling us our Father is in heaven. Our Father knows, and I'm preaching this to myself, my friends, our Father knows that we need those things. He doesn't expect us to go hungry. He doesn't expect us to go wearing rags. He knows we need these things. And so the question is, do I dare actually look at my life at the, at the years ahead, Lord willing, and say, Lord, how are we going to navigate this together? How are we going to navigate this together? And Jesus says, here part of the picture is in verse 33. Here it is. But seek first his kingdom. And kingdom, please understand, isn't necessarily speaking about the kingdom to come. It's a kingdom on this earth, how God operates, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. I've got to tell you a parable by Soren Kierkegaard. And I really like what he says here, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and he says, tells a parable about a lily. A lily that lived by a perfect brook. And it was a beautiful lily. It was more beautiful than Solomon was. And then one day a bird came along. A bird flew along. 
and stayed there for a little while, then fluttered off and would come again and fly off. And the lily began to like this bird, like the bird. And it was part of what I liked was its quirkiness, that we just kind of come and go at random times. The problem was that the little bird was a little proud and naughty. And instead of celebrating the beauty of that lily, it liked to sort of show off its own freedom. This bird was showing off its own freedom. And then, just to make matters worse, this bird would tell that lily about these other lilies that were in other parts of the land that were even more beautiful than that lily. Suddenly, something began to happen in the mind and the heart of that lily that had been content and happy where it was before. And it began to fret. It began to listen. It began to worry, thinking, well, why am I not one of those? Why am I not one of those lilies? I really want to be a crown imperial. I want, to, I want to be someplace else. Finally, this lily, and I'm really summarizing this parable, confessed this internal battle with the bird. Well, finally it was decided that we'd have a plan. Bird flew in one morning and began pecking up the soil there around that lily been pecking it up and then somehow or another in this parable the bird takes that lily under its own wing in hopes of bringing it to a better place and you know what happens in the process that lily wilts and dies now I think you, we all see the clear object lessons of this if that lily had simply just been content in that one moment to thank God for what it was and what even what it was not, it's that its future would have been completely, completely different. And how often we find ourselves in that gap between what is and what we want it to be, and we find discontentment comes in between. Anxiousness, worry, instead of being able to just simply stay in that moment and say, okay, my father knows about this. My father knows about this. He's not ignorant. And he still, these words still hold true to me, and I must remember them. Life is more than so many things that we consider important. And he says, consider the birds of the air. Consider the birds of the air. And consider the lily of the field. Consider them. I want to close with a story about a soldier, we could say, who was born 1943 in Algeria. He died 1961 at the age of 18 in the city of Detroit, Michigan. World War II was going on, and what had happened is things were actually going well for the Allies. Things were moving forward. The, the, the British troops were taking back uh, uh, Italy, and they expected some resistance, so they had prearranged for some air support from Americans to come in and bomb the city they were going to take. Well, the, 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 the British came in, the, the Germans were fleeing quicker than they thought, so the city, this little village of Italy, was taken over a lot quicker than they had planned. The problem is the Americans were planning to bomb that very city. So you say, well, that's easy. Get on the radio and cancel the bombing because, hey, things went better than we planned. Cancel it. Well, as the story goes, as the true story goes, the radios didn't work. So they said, well, get in the Jeep and drive over there. It was too far to drive. So there is one other option. His name is G.I. Joe. He is the, the pigeon. He is the one who was born 1943 in Algiers. He was sent to New Jersey to be trained as a, as a, a passenger pigeon and then brought to the European front. And that's what they had. And so they took a little note, must have written a note. By the way, he, is, he died in the, in, in, in the Detroit Zoological Gardens, but he's, he is stuffed. He is stuffed. You can see him at a museum, obscure museum in New Jersey. So put that on your bucket list, all right? 
got to see this pigeon. But they put a note on that pigeon, let it go. And I'm serious, it's true. Passengers, these pigeons can go up to 70 miles an hour. This guy was doing 60. 20 miles, 20 minutes. He gets to the airbase, they see the message, and they cancel the air support because had the air support would have gone through, of course, the British troops would have been killed, perhaps up to over 100 people. It's interesting how in life we look at our options and we think radio, we're thinking Jeep, but there was a third option. The bird, the bird. It's no wonder Jesus said, consider the birds of the air. Consider the lilies of the valley. And my friends, as we leave this place, may we remember those simple marching orders. As we seek to live a life that is above the smog and the pollution, the fog of today's world, to remember the birds, remember the lilies, and may God help us to do that. Our closing hymn is number 493, Fill My Cup, Lord. I want to share a few words from Mount of Blessing. On the lily's petals, God has written a message for you, written in a language that your heart can read only as it unlearns the lesson of distrust and selfishness and corroding care. 
Why he has, why has he given you the singing birds and the gentle blossoms, but from the overflowing love of a father's heart that would brighten and gladden your path of life? All that was needed for existence would have been yours without flowers and birds, but God was not content to provide what would suffice for mere existence. He has filled earth and air with sky and with glimpses of beauty to tell you of his loving thought for you. The beauty of all created things is but a gleam from the shining of his glory. If he has lavished such infinite skill upon the things of nature for your happiness and joy, can you doubt that he will give you every needed blessing? I invite you to pray. Oh, Lord, worry is something we all do, but it is needless. It is not even of faith. Lord, I pray that as we go forth from here, we will be reminded, we will remind ourselves, we remind each other of who we really belong to. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We know it well. We have it memorized. We perhaps say it every day. But Lord, I pray that we will remember that in those moments when that unexpected bill comes, diagnosis comes, status of employment, parking ticket, whatever it may be, Lord, may we remember it, Lord of who we really are. May we not merely focus on not worrying, but may we focus upon enjoying who we belong to. Be with us as we go forth from here. May your truth not just be an idea, but may it resonate in our minds and in our hearts in the saving blood and the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.